I had a passage female Coopers, and uh, there really wasn't much around there to fly. And I flew her on uh, sparrows. I would just go out into the bushes until I found a sparrow to fly. And one day uh, she made a long flight and ended up in a uh, military zone that was highly restrictive, as you might guess. And they had some, uh, I think they had some atomic weapons. Hey, how's it going everyone? And welcome back for another special milestone edition of the Falcon Retold podcast. We are now sitting at episode 100 and it has been an honor and a privilege as always to be able to continue to bring conversations with falconers from all around the world to you. We hope to continue to do this for many more years, and we hope that you guys will stick with us and continue joining us on our journey. And this episode, as well as the next handful, are brought to you all by the Arizona Falconers Association, who was kind enough to invite us out to Arizona, and we were able to kind of blitzkrieg around the whole state and record a, a handful of great conversations for you all, one of which is with Harry McElroy, who is our guest for our episode 100 milestone. Harry and his wife Beth were kind enough to have us out to their home for a few days where we kind of discussed different aspects of Harry's falconry history, life, and some different memories and, and recollections that I think you'll enjoy hearing. Without Beth's help and also Jamaica Smith's help, it would have been very, very difficult to pull off all of these different things over the span of four or five days. So very special thanks to both of them for helping us pull this off and bring this series to you all. It really meant a lot to be able to do that, and we really hope that you enjoy it. I know for me, this is another one of those bittersweet episodes that I was so happy to be able to do and bring to the falconry community, but also kind of bummed because... I mean, for someone who's been on this earth for 93 years with so much of those 93 years being dedicated to falconry as well, it's impossible to gather all of their stories and, you know, all their memories and experiences. But we do our best. And like I said, I really hope that you all enjoy it and, uh, you know, get something out of it. it this was a, a pleasure to be able to do so. Before we get started in this conversation, I want to go ahead and give another quick shout out to one of our newest sponsors being Bobby Yager Crafts from Poland. If you haven't checked out his stuff yet, I highly recommend you do so. It's well worth the investment in your falconry, checking out some of his amazing handmade equipment. And if you want to do that, there's links on our website now to be able to contact him and get you hooked up with some some great quality falconry equipment. So with all that being said, I am going to go ahead and turn things over now to our guest for episode 100, Harry McElroy. Thank you all very much and enjoy. Here we go. What exactly brought you to this to this area? I, I know it's been really nice, and we've kind of talked about how much quail I've seen around, and and um, you know, just it, I was surprised, just especially on the sides of the roads and everything, just how much you know quarry that there is around here. Whenever you initially were making your move up here, is that pretty much what what drew you up? Was the quail? Uh, yes, it was. Uh... Jamaica suggested that we come up here, and she said there's a lot of quail. Have you always kind of favored a particular species of, of quail versus another to, to hunt? or Not really. I just uh, have hunted whatever's in front of me. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Have you lived around this area for the majority of like like the latter part of your life yeah um you know i lived we lived in uh arizona over 50 years really 
whenever you started off in your early falconry career was it always quail that that kind of suited your fancy or was was it kind of other things to start you off uh i started off with cooper's hawks Mm -hmm. and um i flew mostly house sparrows you know with your experience with the with the cooper's hawks and you know the sparrows i mean about what age was it if you can remember i mean what what age was the kind of the age that you really started being able to practice falconry on a consistent basis well i was about 28 years old when i really started and as far as like the what initially got you in you know like was there an age before then when you were even younger than that that initially you got interested but just couldn't practice yet or were you um i mean was there was there an age before that that you really discovered it and you know said you're going to do it one day but just not now or what really got me started is i used to poke around in the houston uh public library in their research section and there was this one woman who uh, was bringing books to me. You know, you couldn't go in to the research section. You had to have them, you had to tell them what it was you wanted. And they would go in and get it. And this, and I was just reading one thing and another. And one day this woman came up and uh, handed me a falconry book. And that's really where I got started in falconry. Was there a, a, a period of time after that then that you were able to find someone kind of close to you to start kind of watching or, or meet or, or kind of, you know, observe at first? Or At that time, uh, the few falconers that there were were trying to keep it uh private so to speak and they really wouldn't help you so uh there was a falconer in texas city i believe and he wouldn't uh reply to my notes and requests and you know it the old falconers association um whatever it was called, the National Club, was headed by Colonel Meredith. You know, they all wanted to keep it private. Did he ever finally give you the the chance or finally ever respond to your your notes or or letters or anything? What happened was the National Club uh, evolved into NAFA, Mm -hmm. And uh, they decided that uh, they needed political support and all of that. And that's where it evolved into a national sport. Gotcha. And right around that time, is was that about the time that some of the initial like rules and regulations and things got, that got introduced? Or was that even later? No, it was about that time they yeah. started, they they finally realized that um, they had to go with a background of laws and regulations. Yeah, to kind of, is was it more or less to present kind of like a, a united front to, kind of thing and, and just kind of band together and, and make sure that, you know, things stayed, you know, okay within the, the falconry community more or less then. Yes, they were afraid that uh, falconry would be outlawed. Mm-hmm. So they they knew they had to organize and get the support of the membership. Gotcha. And, I mean, around that time, in your experience, was were there a lot of people flying a lot of different species at that time and catching a lot of different types of game, or was it still at that point more 
you know, lure flying with long wings and not so much as much focus on the, the actual hunting aspect of it. It there were a few people who were hunting, but very, very few. Most of the people who were active in hawking were along the East Coast. And uh, they were just flying whatever they had. Uh, mostly it was long wings. When I became interested in, in the sport, and um, it was just a few years before they realized that they couldn't keep hiding. Uh, there were just a handful of us who were associating with one another, and and we just, you know, we just kind of bumbled along. I know before we got started, we were kind of talking about some different things, and I know Jamaica was talking about some of your uh, stories that you had shared with her previously about some of your early falconry experiences in Texas and working on, uh, I believe it was the Armstrong Ranch, right? Could you possibly share uh, some of those experiences just to kind of shed some light on your early falconry career some? I trapped a uh, peregrine along the coast. Uh, the Armstrong Ranch did not reach down to the coast, but next door to it, was uh, one of the King Ranches. It was called the Norius Division. And so I trapped a peregrine along there. And in front of the house where I lived uh, uh, on the Armstrong Ranch was a moderate pond. It was surrounded by trees. And... Uh, any time ducks would come into that pond, um, I would uh, put the peregrine up and uh, and maybe with help from my friends, force the ducks to fly off. And the ducks didn't have anywhere to fly except straight up. You know, they had to go straight up and get out of the way of the trees. So uh, that was, most of my hawking was done right there in my front yard, so to speak. I did hunt around the ranch uh, in different places, but most of the ducks, uh, and, and all I was catching was ducks, uh, most of them were right there in my front yards, as you might say. Uh, I was a, a school teacher, and they had a little one-room schoolhouse, and I taught kids, you know, from f first grade on up to six. Is that what you pretty much did most of your uh, adulthood, or at least early adulthood, for, you know, a, a job? Were you pretty much a teacher most of your life then? Oh, I did various things. Um, I uh, I did school teaching, and then I moved. I got a uh, a thing with the Kellogg Foundation where they taught us to be uh, various things. Uh and I chose counseling and um, specialized reading. So uh, I did that for a few years, and then uh, I went into psychology. I really enjoyed psychology because you just keep seeing different people, you know, and dealing with different problems and things, and you weren't just teaching as such. You were looking at the individual and doing what you could. Because 
I had a reading expertise, I was able to really tune in to disabilities. Uh, most of the people who have some kind of a learning problem are centered on reading, and math is way behind that. So I knew how to do clinical reading, and uh, I could go in and look at this person and give them a few tests, work with them a few days, and really key in on just exactly what their problem was. So then going back to, you know, you being on the ranch and then doing this as a, you know, a school teacher and go ahead and, and pick back up with your, with your story from there then. The people at the ranch, uh, the elder son of the Armstrongs was um, a little kid who had not learned to read. And so with the clinical reading, I looked at him, and they, by the way, had had him to several reading teachers and had not been able to teach him. And uh, so I looked at him, and I thought, well, oh, I can teach this kid to read. And so I taught that kid to read, and... From that, the ranch and everybody they knew in the surrounding ranches kind of figured I was some kind of a genius. <laughs> so uh, wherever I went, you know, there was never any question. If I wanted to do something, they just said, okay, let's do it, you know. So... Uh, I was really treated well, and I would be invited to the uh, the Tobin Armstrongs, who were half owners of the ranch, and they would invite me over to eat and everything. And they had had real formal setups at the dinner table you you can't imagine what it was like <laughs> and uh and then there was uh the old man major armstrong who was also part owner of the ranch and he was married to henrietta clayberg armstrong and henrietta was the major owner of the King Ranches. So I, when the Tobin and family were out traveling and whatnot, well, Henrietta and the major would invite me over to dine with them. And uh, one day she sent me the uh, keys to all of the King Ranches. Had uh, her servant, one of her servants, deliver the keys to all of the King Ranches. So uh, that meant that I, I was able to just go in and out of those King Ranches just like I owned them, <laughs> which... Uh, you might guess, really disturbed the managers. <laughs> they just hated to see me come come through the gate. And uh, I didn't have to ask them or anybody. I just got my little key and went in there. My main form of entertainment, other than hawking, was to go uh, shooting with uh, what they call animal control agents who worked for the federal government. And we would go around the ranches. Uh, we would try to shoot coyotes and bobcats. And 
we also shot uh, as many jackrabbits as we could. I just had a jolly good time. About how much land was there, like total, that you had access to, do you think, if you had to estimate? Well, the Armstrong Ranch was deeded for 55,000 acres, but it had a great deal of land that was judged to be uh, not suitable for running cattle. So it's had the 55,000, and then it had however much, and they never did tell me how much that was, how many acres, but they also had that. So it was really huge. And and as far as what you were doing, I mean, were you pretty much just teaching and then like after you got done teaching, did you pretty much just go hawking straight after or? Yeah, I did. And of course, there were thousands of uh, deer. The large number of them were on the far side of the highway in a in an oak thicket, and there were just deer were in there like you know like cattle. No one was allowed to shoot the deer. It was open to me. You know I could shoot them any time I wanted to. I I only shot one deer. It was in that oak thicket, and the it had they ate. Acorns, and acorns carry a hell of a powerful taste, and I could barely eat that deer. <laughs> Had to really cook it <laughs> to eat it, and I, I never did eat a. I never did shoot another one. I don't know how to describe it, but <laughs> boy, it was really powerful. So. How many years total then were you around all of that amazing land? Two years. Two at years. At the Armstrong Ranch. And so, what what led you to leave? If you uh, lived down there, you become so attached to living on those ranches that you can't leave. So the longer you live there, the more you're attached to that ranch life. And I knew that I was addicted, so uh, I knew I had to leave. What in your mind at the time, though, was it that you thought you needed to still do to kind of get away from the addiction? I mean, what, what was the next thing that you wanted to do that you felt like you needed to get away from there or else you'd be there forever? You know, I watched various people that worked on those ranches. There were three ranches uh, involved, uh, Armstrong, the Norius Division, and then another huge ranch uh, to the east towards Kingsville. And uh, I knew the, the people on these ranches, and I knew they were all addicted, and I knew I had to get out of there. So I told uh, Tobin Armstrong that I was leaving, and one day he called me into his office, and he says, Harry, I've never done anything like this in my life, but uh, here we go. And I said, okay, uh, what's that? And he signed a blank check, handed it to me. He says, this is your raise for next year. He's just an immensely wealthy man. You know, you can't imagine how wealthy these people were. So basically there was, it wasn't so much that there was something else you felt like you needed to move on to. It's just, you knew that you, 
it was just the more the, the the principle of the matter of you just felt like you needed to leave because otherwise you knew you were just going to be there forever, basically. That's, that's right. I loved that place, and especially the people on the on all of the ranches, the three ranches. They all thought I was just some kind of a whiz. Well, since we already kind of talked about some of your early beginnings in falconry and just some of your early beginnings in, in teaching and, and things like that, Harry, let's kind of shift focus a little bit. I, I really kind of am very interested to learn some about why you decided to kind of move out of the States for a little while and, um, you know, what led you to initially move to Ecuador and, um, you know, just kind of talk about that some and, and share any kind of interesting stories that, that might have come along with that. Well, uh, actually, Beth wanted to go to Ecuador. And um, we had a friend down there who had taught school for me while I was a principal. And, um, and she was inviting us down. I'm assuming that falconry was part of the decision-making process kind of in that sum, was it not? It was just a kind of an offshoot. It was something that I did after I got there. I just I d- didn't really uh, get into it too deeply in Ecuador. I oh, gotcha. Well, whenever you did get down there, I mean, was it mainly another Harris Hawk that you decided to try and, and fly while you were down there then? Yes, it was a Harris. And I'm I'm assuming that there were probably challenges that went along with that? There were. Um, the difficulty, maybe, was uh, that my uh, telemetry wasn't working very well. And so eventually this hawk just flew off and I wasn't able to follow it very far. It went off down a valley and uh, just kept going. Yeah, I can imagine with as many trees and as dense as it was down there and stuff, I know that sometimes UHF is a little bit more beneficial in some of the open areas and VHF can be some, some somewhat more beneficial in other types of areas, but in a dense jungly kind of area, I can only imagine that nothing would, I mean, probably nothing was working then. <laughs> Well, certainly my set did not function properly. And I'm assuming this was kind of in the early days of telemetry too, probably, wasn't it? Kind of not too long after uh, beeps and stuff were, you know, kind of put on the market and the standard beeping transmitters and things. Comparatively speaking, it was in the early days. So, I mean, whenever you were kind of getting around in that area, I know that kind of when we were talking before, you kind of shared a little bit of a fascination or I guess love for, for other types of birds as well whenever you were down there, right? Uh, well, I, w- I was really interested in parrots. And what led to kind of the fascination or the interest in, in parrots? Was there a particular experience that you had or anything, or did you already like them? Oh, I already liked parrots, and uh, we had had some in the States. I can only imagine how hard it probably was to get from place to place in that area. Did you have to take a lot of like buses or what, what was the transportation like around there to get from place to place? Yeah, primarily I was taking uh, public buses. I can only imagine probably some of the interesting experiences you had with people on some of those buses down there. <laughs> what well, were a couple of uh, interesting experiences you had when you were on those buses going from place to place? Well, one of the funniest ones was uh, I was going to get my uh, driver's license and uh, I got on one of the local buses and the, the local people are rather small, so their buses are, are not very high, so you can't really stand up in them. So um, I got on this, uh, 
what you would call a local bus going to the next town over with a um, servant, and he he was riding the bus with me, and there were all native people on the bus. And to my horror, he said, uh, shame on you people, uh, you can't offer a seat to this white man and look how uncomfortable he is standing up. And the, these people were Native Americans, you know. And, and one of them jumped up and he says, oh, that's right, I am ashamed of this. And he says, here, take my seat. He grabs me and he pushes me into his seat. And just as soon as I got there, across the aisle, another one jumped up. He says, no, I'm embarrassed about this. He, gotta, he has to take my seat. And, and he grabbed me and pulled me over there. And pretty soon the whole damn bus <laughs> uh, the, and the Indian people, you know, the, the native people were just killing themselves laughing. And, and normally they're pretty, you know, quiet around white people. <laughs> and they were pulling me all over that bus. And <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine probably that initial, like, you know, what have I gotten myself into kind of feelings and, you know, uh, the initial kind of culture shock and then, yeah, realizing that you were getting messed with towards the end. I can only imagine probably how you felt. You said the whole bus ended up like pulling you from seat to seat. Yeah, they were just pulling and tugging and, you know, there was nobody sitting down. They were all in the aisle of the bus and pulling on me, you know. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. Well, did the did the natives in that area then whenever you in all your travels in that area, did they find any other creative ways to, to mess with you in, on some of your other trips? Or uh, was that the most creative way that they <laughs> they decided to, to mess with you? They were, in general, they were rather quiet and gentlemanly. When I, when I got to the place... Uh, to get the, um, on another trip, I got to the place to take the license exam. I was sitting out in the car with Gregory and uh, our servant went in to get things arranged for me to go in. And to my surprise, uh, when my turn came up, the the servant said, Oh, look, he's busy babysitting. I'll take the exam for him. <laughs> and she took the driver's license exam for me. <laughs> well you didn't you didn't end up failing, did you? <laughs> did she pass no, for you? No, she passed. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It definitely sounds like a different world. It's it is really different. I I you know traveled around looking for parrots, and on one trip I was coming back, and I heard, a, and I was on a bus, and I heard a parrot call out. So I went poking around, and I found uh, this gentleman and his wife, and they had uh, something like three parrots. And uh, I said, oh, um, I've been looking for this species of parrot. Um, would you mind selling it? And he said, oh, no, I wouldn't sell it under any circumstance. Uh, I promised I would give these to my wife. He said, so absolutely no, 
uh, I wouldn't sell one. And I said, oh, okay, well, I was going to give you $20 for it. And the whole bus, <laughs> everybody in the bus stopped talking, turned around, started looking at me, you know. And he said, did you say $20? And I said, yeah, would, uh, would that be enough? And he looked at his wife, you know, and she... <laughs> Giving him the head nod. <laughs> you know, they didn't pay anything like that for <laughs> parrots. Parrots were really cheap down there. So I ended up buying one of those. You were probably in Ecuador not... It sounds like you weren't there very long, though, and kind of when we were talking previously, right? Because you, you said that a friend came and, and visited when we were talking before, and... Um, Eventually, you guys decided that it probably wasn't the best place for you to be, and you decided you needed another change of scenery, right? And then was it Peru that you ended up? Uh, yeah, we uh, Ecuador was not real colorful, and um, when a friend showed up from um, Peru, yeah, we decided then to move. We went down to Lima. It was uh, kind of a dangerous place. We had a car that needed mechanical attention. I remember the mechanic uh, said, oh, don't drive in here with your windows down. Says it's really, really dangerous says, keep your windows all the way up when you drive into this section of of Lima. So did you listen? <laughs> or did you just say, yeah, oh, you know. I was reluctant, but I did. It, it was really hot. Whenever you were driving through there, did you see examples of, of why he told you to keep your windows up? <laughs> I, I I didn't actually see any, but I knew that uh, crime was a big thing. <laughs> it depends on what area you're in, you know. As you might know, Mexico is the same right now. There are states that the federal people tell you not to go into in Mexico. Yeah, there are definitely periods of time down there where they tell you to steer clear of certain roadways in certain areas, more so than others, depending on what's going on down there. But as far as Lima, whenever you got settled in and kind of figured out where you're going to live up there, you got to know some of the falconers in the area. Were there any particular falconers that you ended up hawking with more than others? And what were some of your experiences like, you know, hawking in that area? Well, Oscar had a, um, what is it, bicolored hawk, and he and I flew together, and I had an aplomado. And when his little bicolored hawk would, would catch one of those birds on the coast, my aplomado would fly in and take it. They didn't fuss over it. He just took it. This is uh, down on the coast, you know. We had a particular swampy area where we hunted. Was there anything that you did while you were, while you were down there than, than trap and hunt? Or? Yeah, we were going up in the, in the mountains, and uh, we were looking for... Some kind of a hawk. I don't remember just what it was. But was it aplomados or was it a... Could have been aplomados. Were you supposed to be up there? <laughs> yeah, it was okay to be up there, but this depends on where you were. There was probably some places you weren't supposed to go, though, I bet, right? There were places that uh, there were a rebellious bunch, and they were very, very dangerous. You wouldn't dare go up there uh, after nightfall. And I'm assuming that whenever you were kind of going in and out of these different smaller towns or places, 
looking for birds and doing these other things around these areas that you probably had some interesting experiences at uh, some of these other smaller towns and restaurants and things too, I bet, right? We, uh, we trapped a couple of aplomados and, and uh, went in this restaurant to eat. And it was too hot to leave the hawks in the car. So we brought them in and we had them on the table. And uh, the waitress came up and she said, well, boys, uh, how do you want them? We can fry them. <laughs> we can bake them. And, you know, she's named off all these ways of cooking them. We said, do you... Uh, you really eat these hawks? She says, oh, yeah, we eat them all the time. Well, did you have to kind of guard them for the rest of the meal to make sure they didn't <laughs> they didn't take them from you? <laughs> we were careful. <laughs> well, I mean, did you, so you didn't have any accidental run-ins with anybody that, that tried to shoot at you or anything whenever you were traversing all these different areas and stuff? We had, we would go up into the highlands to trap and then in the evenings we went back down quite a ways to a um to a motel um a hotel and we we took our car into their fenced in area at night and that's where the lady wouldn't tell us where this road was because it was so dangerous. I remember us telling her, look, we pay our bills. We're not drunk and disorderly. Um, why won't you tell us where this place is? And she says, well, if I tell you where it is, uh, they're going to capture you. And the first thing they'll do is they'll kill this American. <laughs> and then she said, and she named off what all they would do to the locals that were with us. Yeah, my, my curiosity for that road would probably be pretty uh, stamped down after that. Believe it or not, we found the road and we went down it and <laughs> we went hawking. We went, you know, trapping down that road. But we did not stay and we... We knew when the sun started going down to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Well, at least you were that smart <laughs> at the time. Yeah, at least we had that much <laughs> intelligence. Uh, it's just another prime example of how we can get so ate up we don't know what's good for us. When then was it, I mean, was it shortly after all that that you guys decided that, you know, maybe we shouldn't stick around here either and, and make another move and was about that time that you decided to move to Mexico then? When we would uh, decide to change locations, I would look up the local falconers and ask them what the area was like and what there was to hunt and all of that. Was there just a, a core group of, of guys that you primarily became friends with whenever you made the move to Mexico and, and hunted with regularly too? and? When we got to Mexico, uh, we would have falconers coming in every weekend to visit. And sometimes it was a different group, and sometimes it was part of the, you know, whoever the crowd was. But they just, we were never without a group of falconers. In Mexico. Whenever you were trying to to get Apollos, whenever you were down there and stuff, did you have any other interesting experiences or stories during that time when you were trying to trap or, or fly birds? It was Mexico that, uh, you know, there are police checkpoints in in all of these countries. I, I experienced that during my last trip, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at one of the checkpoints, 
we had been out hawking. It was a large group of us. And they said, oh, uh, we're going to take these hawks. You shouldn't have them. And we said, well, we've never had any trouble before. What is it? And he said, well, you don't have permits. So the guy went around looking at all of the hawks. And he said, now, we want you to show up at this zoo tomorrow, and we're going to take all of the hawks. And we said, well, okay. And he said, and don't, don't try to fool us. I have looked at each hawk. He says, I know each hawk. He says, so don't try to change them around or any of that foolishness. He said, you bring these hawks tomorrow morning. So um, we had a little money, not very much, but I, you know, we had a little money and, and they said, uh, Harry, you stay in the car because if you come in here, uh, they're going to want more money, you being an American. So in they went, and he said, okay, uh, I'm going to take all of the hawks. And, and they said, oh, and so that during that night, we re went around town collecting all of the old beat-up falconry hawks, the ones that weren't worth very much. <laughs> and we took them with us <laughs> to give to him. And so uh, when they went into the zoo, he says, okay, um, I want you to give me a certain amount of money. And we didn't have that much money. So we sat, th they sat there and debated and talked to him and, everything and finally um he agreed to take whatever money we had and he was really angry that we didn't have as much money as he wanted and this is this guy was a, a police officer of course he told us what office to go to in town to uh, get permits. So we went down there, and the, the guy said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll make up your permits, but I'm real busy. Um, can you come back in the afternoon? And, you know, in Mexico, uh, it takes forever to get a permit. You know, and we said, yeah, we'll we'll be back this afternoon. We went back, and he had already made out all of the permits and everything. He just handed them over to us. And, oh, by that time, we had a little extra money in our pockets, and we gave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, a real surprise see some guy in a permit office that wanted to serve the public. I think you had mentioned before we started recording that you ended up going to Veracruz at some point to try and, uh, try and trap bat falcons and stuff too, right? Yeah, I remember one guy had bat falcons nesting uh, on his property out front of his house and uh, went up there and we got a, it was a very small tree. Someone climbed up and took a couple of bat falcons. There were imprints. We flew them, but they didn't really get into falconry they uh they would knock a bird down but then they wouldn't go down to the grab ground and grab it 
They would just keep flying. Uh, it's kind of frustrating. <laughs> what do you think the reason for that was? Well, um, I saw falconers in the States, and only one of them claimed that his bat falcons always caught birds. And I suspected that he was uh, pulling our leg a little <laughs> bit because of all of the falconers that I came across in the States, uh, none of them had any luck flying bat falcons. I think it was probably more just unfamiliarity with how the species kind of operated normally in the wild and stuff and, you know, just kind of a general lack of knowledge on how to adapt, you know, to that or, you know, just probably not a species that's just suited for falconry. Well, that's what I assumed uh, when I found that falconers, no matter where they were, were not having any luck with them. Well, that makes sense. Well, I mean, it sounds like you had some pretty amazing experiences then while you were, you know, traversing around. And out of curiosity, why was it then that you decided to finally leave Mexico and, and head back to the States? What was the reason behind that? The thing that happened was uh, I was down in the uh, kitchen cleaning um, uh a pigeon, I think it was, and I had blood all over my hands. And Gregory came into the room from upstairs and looked at my hands. He grabbed my hand. He says, Miras, Papa, Sangri. And I just thought, okay, he's speaking, he's thinking. In Spanish, it's time for him to go back home. He's going to be an American the rest of his life, you know. Mainly then, it was it was more of an issue where you just wanted to kind of have more of uh, the American, you know, way of life then, more or less. Exactly. We, yeah. you know, we're Americans and we want to live as Americans. Gotcha. I believe it was you guys decided to move back to the States and, and go to Idaho first. You're really only there a couple years, and it really just wasn't that enjoyable is kind of the, the vibe that I'm getting. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't the best. I, I really struggled. And so basically from there, you decided, you know, say, screw this. We're, we're going to go back to, you know, Arizona then at that point and, and give that another shot. Yeah. Gotcha. So after asking around uh, to some friends and, and uh, you know, other falconers that you knew then, was it, uh, was it uh, Wilcox then that you decided to, to end up back in Arizona? Yeah, that's where we went first. Yeah, so you were in Wilcox for 19 years then, and basically from there, that's where you, I don't know if I'm, my understanding is, is correct, and that's where you really kind of, kind of went full in with the uh, other aspects of your falconry with like Appomattos, horseback, that kind of stuff then, right? Yeah. I guess a sizable part of that was with the Appomattos. I mean, at that point in time, was that a, a bird that you felt like you were going to fly for a while then whenever you started flying them? Or? Yes, I was really fond of them. What qualities about them made you fond of them? I mean, what, what aspect of flying Appomattos was really enjoyable to you? The major thing that attracted me to them was that they were social. And um, like social kind of in a way that, that Harris Hawks are social or a different kind of social? No, uh, much the same thing. I wonder if I can go back to that second year of flying in Wilcox. Mm-hmm. Can we do that sure. just a let's, minute? Yeah, let's go for it. Uh, during the second year, I had a passage female Coopers, mm -hmm. and uh, there really wasn't much around there to fly. 
and I flew her on uh, sparrows. And um, I would just go out into the bushes until I found a sparrow to fly. And one day uh, she made a long flight and ended up in a uh, military zone that was highly restrictive, as you might guess. <laughs> and they had some, uh, I think they had some atomic weapons on this base. And so she went in there, and I thought, oh, boy, I'm, <laughs> I've really got a problem here. And I went up to the main gate, and I said, hey, you know, I, I, my hawk has flown a sparrow into the interior here, and I'd like to go in and get her. And I said, you can hear the beep here on the radio. And they said, oh, okay, go ahead. And they sent me in there without anyone with me or anything. <laughs> and then it was uh, several weeks later, I got another flight into the military zone. And I went over to the, in the main gate again and asked to go in and get my hawk and showed them the little beep and everything. And they said, oh, okay, we've been talking about that. Uh, do you mind if we go with you? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I gave the military police the permission to go into the military zone. <laughs> so then I, I have to just ask, I mean, was, was the area you were hunting around there just so good that you felt compelled <laughs> You needed to keep hunting right next to a a military base, and <laughs> um, I, I guess this is probably and what I'm getting at is another example of how sometimes if a spot's so good, we'll we'll just keep taking the risk, even even though we sometimes probably shouldn't. But uh, uh, both of these flights into this restrictive military zone were real long flights. Gotcha. Okay. So I. I tried to stay away from that. Luckily, you didn't stumble onto anything or see anything while you're in there that you weren't supposed to, I guess. <laughs> I guess I didn't. I don't know. I just, when I talked to those guys, the military police, it just astounded me that they would even let me go in and get the damn hawk, much less go ahead. Yeah, going back then, you know, I, I know very little if anything, really hardly at all about utilizing horses, especially in falconry. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I know it's something that you can read about in, in the books that you've written and, and things like that. But yeah, if you don't mind, just kind of go in a little bit more about which particular, you know, type of horse that, that ended up being, you know, your favorite type, uh, you know, to use or ride and, um, and kind of go into that just a little bit first. I'm not exactly sure uh, how I got that started on uh, Peruvian Passos, but once I did, I kind of fell in love with that being on a gated horse. So I, I really liked uh, gated horses. Well, you kind of started off some with mules, too, right? What were uh, some of your initial experiences with those? Well, the mules were varied. You know, if you get... It's difficult to get a good mule because once anyone starts riding one, they don't want to part with it. So to get a good mule is not as easy as you would think. Was there a particular mule that you had that kind of comes to mind as being more exceptional than some of the others that you had previously? Jody was not gated, but it was just a good, smooth, reliable ride. And uh, then I discovered this 
gated horse thing with the Peruvian pasos, and I just switched over to them. So out of curiosity, since I'm still kind of ignorant to the world of horses and you know to some of the terminology when it comes to horseback riding and, and things, what do you mean by gated horses? Could you maybe clarify that a little bit for those who might not really be familiar with that, including myself? Well, there is a uh, proper description of the gated horse, and I think it involves uh, they keep one foot on the ground at all times. So, you know, when you think of a horse loping, they're jumping up off of the ground, right? But with a, a gated horse, they keep that one foot on the ground at all times. And the Peruvian is the only horse that all of them are, are gated. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that at all. Yeah, when you're you're dealing with a gated horse breed, uh, it's a kind of a uh, gamble because you might buy several of certain horses that are said to be gated, but uh, they aren't. All right. Well, thanks for clarifying and expounding on those things, some. I want to go ahead and switch gears now, though, to the breeds of dogs that you prefer and talk a little bit about what aspects of the particular breeds that you use kind of attracts you to them and makes you want to incorporate them into your falconry. I like the German uh, short hair and the German wear hair. Uh, they are bred to work in clothes. And usually uh, they're easy to work with. Well, and you've used English pointers some too, haven't you? Yeah, the English pointer is a dog that really reaches out way out there. And uh, you need to know what you're doing to run them. Uh, they really are the best. There's no question. Uh, as the English will tell you, the British will tell you, they're the only dog. They really are a high-quality animal. Was there a, a particular dog or two that you had then that were truly special, that were kind of almost irreplaceable? I had uh, one German short hair that uh, was something exceptional. And a number of times I was out there and searching and searching and just gave up and started to walk back to my truck. And the dog came up with the quail in his mouth. Was that Beethoven that you were talking about before we started recording earlier? Yeah, Beethoven. If most of this stuff happened whenever you were in Wilcox, then what was the primary reason why then you decided to relocate again after that? I remember you mentioning something about there being like a big drought or you know something to that degree that made you decide to, to relocate again, but why the move then and finally settling in, in Kingman? Well... The thing about Wilcox was it stopped raining down there. So the quail were just practically an endangered species. So basically your you know, time in, in, in Wilcox, and I mean, it was still pretty much just all quail. That's really, at that time, that's all you were really wanting to hunt. All you were really wanting to do was just quail, 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 pretty much. Yeah, right. So then you showed up to Kingman, and you were pretty enamored with it right off the bat then, right? Oh, I just thought it was fabulous. Yeah, I bet. I mean, like I was telling you earlier, I was really surprised at, you know, just the amount of quail and, and even some of the jackrabbits and stuff that I 
saw crossing the roads as I was driving in here even during the night and driving around this morning. I was just really surprised by how much there was. You know, when when we first moved up here, we moved in, uh, rented a house next door to the Smiths. And uh, I was seeing people around town now and again, and they would ask me, why did you move up here? And uh, and I'd tell them to hunt quail. And they would say, quail? They're everywhere. That that would be their remark. They're everywhere. I, like I said, I don't know if that's something that I could ever get used to seeing. You know, I, it's... It's kind of like other times when I've gone out west and I've seen like pheasant run across the road and and things like that. It's just like where I where I live, you just don't see those things. It just doesn't happen. I think the closest thing I've come to seeing something like that is I've seen some some uh, bob white, a little like a, sh- a very small covey of bob white, just kind of crossing the road one time. And aside from accidentally bumping a covey here and there, it, we don't have very much of the of those type of game in abundance anymore where I'm at. So it's always kind of a (laughs) a pleasant, uh, it's a pleasant sight to see, but it's always kind of um, shocking. Well, Beth can tell you some mornings we look out on the front yard and they, and the front yard, you can't even see the front yard. It's just quail. Well, Let's go ahead and, and switch gears a little bit then. And I know when we were talking some the other day too, we had uh, or you had kind of mentioned a couple of things about the last bird that you kind of you know flew for an extended period of time, which was like your Germato, I believe. Do you have any? I don't know, kind of um, anecdotes or. I don't know, things that you kind of want to share in regards to, you know, that type of hybrid that you either liked or or disliked? Well, I think it's worth mentioning that just in general, they're very difficult. They're skittish, and they're very difficult to manage. And if you see... What falconers do in general, uh, it's unusual to find someone who catches a lot of game with them. Uh, The people that are more successful with them are flying uh, around buildings and things, and they're flying, uh, what, not quail, but they're f- pigeons and things like that, or pardon, like pi- p- pigeons. pigeons. And, yeah, they're flying pigeons mm-hmm. for the most part. Is it because you think it's just it's a hybrid that's made up of of two species that are really like pursuit based in their kind of orientation? Well, they are both of them, both of those species are direct flight Mm -hmm. types for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people fly jur falcons from a waiting on position at regular game birds, you know, larger birds and ducks. But uh, around here, all you have is quail. And my bird tended always to carry. It wanted to get away. And if people were flying with me, if they walked up, you know, fairly close to it after after it had caught a quail, uh, it would flush and carry way to hell out there. <laughs> Do you have a a, a particular story that comes in mind or a particular experience that comes in mind with that particular bird that's that's worth sharing? One of the things that uh, I had moderate success with 
and picking it up on quail was a stick with a a nail in the end of it. And I would go in and punch into the quail while it was eating. So uh, I was su fairly successful in doing that. Um, the other thing was to just stand beside it while it was eating and and just wait until it was through. And as soon as it was through, it still thought it was hungry and it would jump to the fist. But if you waited a little while, it realized it was well fed and it would not come to the fist. So then you were in for an all-night affair. <laughs> well, and was there a particular all-night affair that you had then that that's, that kind of sticks out? Well, I... I had a number of them. Uh, what would happen when it would stay out all night is I would get as close as I could. Uh, I would drive the truck up close as I could and just wait, you know, for light in the morning. And most of the time in the morning, it would just come right to the fist. The most dramatic thing about this hawk was that it was imprinted. So when it would fly at a quail and it couldn't find any place to perch, you know, within a reasonable distance where the quail flew in, it would turn around and come back to the fist or come to my shoulder or something. So it was really very faithful about returning to me. It sounds to me then like it was a bird that definitely had its quirks. I'm sure it was enjoyable, but it, I, I mean, it sounds like there was definitely some times that weren't in, enjoyable <laughs> to fly. It was a difficult hawk mm -hmm. to fly. You Would you say that it was like one of the most challenging birds that you ever flew? Yes, I would. Yeah. I, uh... I was more fond of it than any falcon I've had. Boomerang is what we call it because, boy, you would get a flight, it'd go out of sight, and you, you know, you'd stand there for a while wondering what, and, and you'd start, you'd finally give up, get out the telemetry and start to follow the signal and zoom, it'd come in and land on your head or your shoulder or something. I have I have talked to maybe, I think maybe two or three falconers that have ever flown that particular type of hybrid. And they did say some similar things to what, to what you said. So, you know, like I said, for, for some of these, different types of species and hybrids that not very many people fly. I always like getting their opinions and their experiences on that. So I think this is probably a good time then to go ahead and kind of get a couple of last thoughts from you. I kind of told you the other day that I like getting, you know, pieces of advice from falconers that have been doing this for a very long time and had, a lot of experiences, you know, like you have. So what in your mind do you think is one of the best pieces of advice that you can leave for, you know, either current or future generations of people that are already in the sport or, or looking to get into it? Uh, the, the one thing that I see uh, as, as more important than anything else, for me to get the type of consistency that I want, uh, I concentrate on weight control. And my system is a, a very simple one. I feed up to a given weight according to the weather. The weather is here almost always moderate, you know, so, so you just feed up to a given weight 
the night before. And that puts your hawk back down into flight weight the next day at flight time. More or less going back to the the whole 22, you know, to 24 hour window, basically, that you've described before then, basically. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so, I mean, there's, has there ever really been many instances that you can think of where that system is, has failed you at all, or has it always been pretty tried and true? Well, it, it, when you talk about weight control, you're talking about variability. And uh, you can't really depend on it. It, it may vary. Mm-hmm. And, and it can vary you know, enough to affect uh, recovering the hawk. So then let me pose this this question then. On top of the weight control then, what aspects of, you know, other types of falconry can people make sure that they're doing correctly when it is that they're trying to get to know their bird? I mean, I know that for me, learning to read an individual bird is always very important. Are there, is there anything in particular that, that you think you do that's different or unique? Or do you feel like you do the same as a lot of people and just try and, you know, just get to know your individual bird and get to know its tendencies and just kind of adapt to it then? That's the basis that's the basic part is whenever I get a new bird, I look it over very carefully and see what it's going to do. Uh, some of them train uh, just like you're looking in one of the old English books and you, you know, you do this, 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 and this. And that's the way you train a bird, period. But, of course, I don't do that. I look at the bird and work with it according to how it will adjust. Some birds you can keep for years, and they never adjust to falconry. They insist on being themselves. And uh, to me... That's very important. Outstanding. Like I said, I I really appreciate you letting me into your home the last few days, and it's been really amazing getting to know you all. And um, like I said, I think this is probably a, a pretty good note to end. Like I said, I want to say thank you again for doing this, and um, you know, for for sharing a lot of this stuff with with people uh, across the world. My pleasure. Thank you.